Hey, everybody. First of all, I am so sorry that we are not live together. I really apologize for missing that class with you guys, but it was a, a rough week for us and we had just lost our puppy of 15 years. It was her time. She's chasing all the butterflies around possible, but it was a, a day full of tears. So, um, Thank you for your patience, and I am so excited to share this class with you. I really love the power of forest medicine via things like lichen. So let me go ahead and pull up my slides, and we will get into this class. I have a few videos I'll share just to give you a better descriptor of the lichen we're talking about and how you can find them out in the forest, too. So here we are. Let's do it. Let's talk about lichen. So one thing to know about lichen, and this is hard for me as I teach this class, is I always want to say herb or I want to say plant or something along those lines, but lichen are not plants. What they are are algae and fungi, right? So part mushroom or fungi, part algae, and the algae and the fungi have come together to take a lichen to each other. Cheesy as that may be, it's a little joke I've used since I did environmental ed tours back in like 2000. So hopefully you got a little chuckle out of it. And today, the primary lichen we are going to talk about are lungwort and usnea. So we'll definitely dive deeper into each of these and what they mean for you. <clears throat> so Lungwort is a really cool lichen that looks a lot like lung tissue. Its name is Loberia pulmonaria. And when we hear that pulmonaria, we know that we're talking lungs, right? Because pulmonary arteries, that's that's all lung work right there. So keeping that in mind is really important. And then we have usnea, and there are many different species of usnea. The word usnea is actually an Arabic word. It's derived from an Arabic word, usna, which means moss. And then there are several different um, species of them. The barbata means beard or barbed. And oftentimes, Usnea will be called beard moss or beard lichen, bear's beard, old man's beard is a really, really common one for it. Um, there because it looks like a beard. And we'll we'll talk about that again in a little bit uh, as we go through the slides. And then we've got the lung wart as well, which can be called lung lichen, lung moss, oak moss, and all kinds of things. So I wanted to talk about these also. I would be very surprised if they don't uh, pop up somewhere in the forest near you. So usnea, that's this one right here. And yes, I'll have some other videos to share with you. But it is really a very slow growing lichen. And it's got like these branching round strands with a grayish green to a yellowish green outer part of this um, lichen and in the middle i'll show you in a video but in the middle is kind of like a corded elastic kind of thing and it's white it's really interesting to see uh, when you're out in the wild and it's a great way to know that you actually have usnea and then for the lungwort, um, it loves to grow, actually both of these love to grow on all kinds of trees. So they love the spruces, they love the firs, the cottonwood, the pines, the oaks. Um, they really love moist, damp, and humid areas. And they do not grow when there's a lot of air pollution. Like they do not like it at all. Sad thing is some of these are being threatened with so many clear cuts and things like ha that happening in the old growth forests around the world, which is heartbreaking for so many different reasons. And um, yeah, it's just really, really powerful medicine. And I'm sure that it's growing all around you. And it's so easy to gather, which we'll talk again about in just a moment. 
You also have other lichen around you that I don't know of as well medicinally. I did look into Janice Schofield's book a little bit about reindeer moss and Iceland moss. I didn't hear a lot about medicine, at least not as powerfully as I know Usnia and Lungwort to be. So we'll talk about it a bit and definitely recommend checking out Janice's book to learn a few more tips there. Um, but you'll typically find these in open areas, in bogs, in the tundra, and in forests from Alaska all the way down to Northern California. I see them around in my Oregon forests as well. I just don't know them as medicine. <clears throat> so for identification, I'm going to pull up a couple of videos just to show you. Um, but technically, lichen don't have leaves or stems. Instead, what they have are root stems, and they're like these fiber-like kind of rhizoids, right? They lack the organs in them to actually be able to draw up water, which is interesting because then it makes the way it absorbs its nutrients more like a sponge kind of absorbing fluids throughout their whole surface, which is part of why these lichen are so susceptible to being damaged by pollutants in the air and the entire atmosphere. So really do pay attention to that. In fact, in Switzerland, the presence or the absence of various lichen is what tells those people whether the forest or the area they're in is healthy air to be breathing or not. So really, really interesting, something to keep in your mind and pay attention to as you go throughout life. Um, let's see, the Usnia, I think I already talked about it. Let me pull up my video really quickly and share that with you so you can just kind of see the stretchy white cortex. It's almost like a, a rubber band in there. So this is just a quick video of me walking along the forest, gathering the medicine that I shared with you guys. It's just right on the forest floor. It's so easy to gather. And this is just a small bunch of Usnia. And as I grab it, you can see that it's kind of stretchy, almost like a rubber band or hair tie. And on the outside, we have that light greenish color to it. But if you were to get really close, and I, I, it was hard for me to film this, but inside of this cordage is actually white. And that's the stretchy part, almost like you would use a rubber band, like a hair tie that you buy in the grocery store that's covered in cloth and things. So it's very, very similar in that realm. And now I just want to show you a quick um, look at lungwort lichen. So if you look at this stuff, it looks a lot like you would imagine lung tissue to look, only it's green. And it's going to be a bright green on the top and a lighter green on the bottom when it's wet. It will dry very, very quickly, in fact, almost overnight, and then you can re-wet it to get this moist, like, rubbery context to it. So um, I really love this plant, or this lichen, there I go, saying plant. I love this lichen for so many reasons. It's really powerful. And I will share some stories about it with you here in just a moment. So let's just look at that one more time, the whole video through. And this will just fall off of branches after a good storm. And it's so easy, so easy to gather. Okay, I just wanted to share those with you quickly so you know the abundance of this medicine out there. And we will get back to our slides and get back to the lesson. So yeah, that is the skinny of how to identify these. I really love how the lungwort will get slippery when wet. Like you could put it into your hot tea water right now and it'll go from dry and almost crispy to the exact same consistency as I found it on the forest floor. So speaking of finding it on the forest floor, when you're wild crafting this, whether it's from deciduous trees or coniferous trees, it really does love those humid and shady low elevation forests throughout the Pacific Northwest. 
the best thing to do is to make sure you're gathering it off of the ground, right? We don't want to take it off of trees where it is working hard to grow and to live because Mother Nature is going to bless us with all of this easy, easy, easy to harvest medicine after the wind blows. Super simple, nice little rainstorm, anything like that. You'll find it all over the forest floor. <clears throat> so... There are a ton of historic uses that we'll talk about here. So um, Usnia longissima, which is a, a very long strand of Usnia, is known in Mandarin as San Luau. And it's been prescribed as an expectorant. So it's going to help loosen up congestion and stuck mucus in the respiratory tract. People also apply it externally. They'll make a powder into it to help heal skin ulcers. They use the alcohol extract to treat things like um, lymphedema and tuberculosis, things along those lines. The Usnia Barbata in Romania was listed as medicine in their Pharmacia Nat Naturae and their floral, Flora Medicinal all the way back in 1929. And then prior to the 1700s, physicians, when they were working with lichens, mosses, and things along those lines, they would classify them all into one bunch, like they'd call them all lichen or all moss, and they would put those in the pharmacopoeias as such. So if you don't know what a pharmacopoeia is, it's basically the list of plant medicines that people used over different eras of life. Um, but because they grouped these different lichen, these different mosses into one big bundle, it makes it really, really hard for us to determine which species or genera we are talking about when it comes to lichen medicine historically. One thing I like to think about, if you've taken some of my classes, you may have heard me talk about the doctrine of signatures which refers to, in this particular case with usnia, we might think about how it does look about like our hair. So maybe we could use it as a hair and a scalp remedy. And in fact, it was used as a hair and a scalp remedy. The Haida natives used fibers of the usnia longissima to filter out various impurities from hot pitch before they would use that pitch medicinally. Um, there is also an Arctic pharmacognosia where uh, Mr. Smith wrote that the Aleut, Aleut um, reported using reindeer moss tea for chest pains, and uh, it was also used by native hunters for various things, like climbing hills, they would eat it in order to maintain their breath and their wind. Um, and it was said to you, be used to stop diarrhea, which is fascinating. And I could see that happening because it does have astringent properties to it, meaning that it's going to help dry up excessive mucosal secretions and things along those lines. And it's been since about the 18th century that herbalists prescribed Iceland moss for the treatment of various chest ailments, digestive upset, and tuberculosis. There is a book out there called The Complete Book of Health Plants. And in it, it says that the um, Cetraria contains the carbohydrate complexes lichenin and isolichenin and a bitter principle property called Cetrarin. They would use this for bronchial catarrh and they would make an infusion of the lichen or make them into different lozenges where they'd combine the lichen mucilage, so the slimy, slippery stuff, with some gums and sugar and make that into a nice, tasty lozenge. And then today, there's a lot of scientific evidence around the acids that are really create certain acids within there that are creating a really, really strong antibiotic activity, which we will talk about a bit more. <clears throat> so one of my teachers is Christopher Hobbs. He's absolutely brilliant. And 
He referred in in a book about usnia being an antibiotic, and in World War II, researchers discovered that more than half of the lichen species tested contain, contained compounds that were effective against gram-positive bacteria, such as streptococcus, staphylo staphylococcus, pneumonia, um, and all kinds of amazing things. I think it's a really, really fascinating to check into that kind of stuff. Oh, and in Egyptian times, there were reports of lichens being blended with spices and sawdust, and they were then used to perfume and mummify, used as perfume and to mummify corpses. Very, very fascinating. And today it's still being used for its scent in the perfume industry. Really, really interesting to think of those things. Um, Dioscorides in 69 AD named lichen after the Greek leprous due to a resemblance between the plants and the skin of those with leprosy. Interesting. Maybe that's another doctrine of signatures kind of thing. So there's a lot going on with lichen, but again, it makes it really, really hard to understand which lichen and which mosses these people were talking about when they were all put into the pharmacopoeias under one. So it's a little bit tricky and scary when we're trying to use it as medicine today, but thankfully um, there's still evidence of plenty of great medicine like usnea, for instance. This stuff is a very, very potent antibacterial and antifungal uh, lichen, and it has wonderful immunomodulating activities. So it knows when to boost or stimulate the immune system, and it also knows when to just kind of calm down the immune system in cases of, let's say, we have an autoimmune disorder and the immune system is attacking itself repetitively we can turn to some immunomodulators to be incredibly helpful there. <clears throat> the antibacterial properties of usnea are attributed to usnic acid, which is a bitter principle that is in the gray to green part of the cortex. So the, the outer part of it has this usnic acid. And according to various animal studies that have been done, this usnaic acid is more effective than penicillin against various bacterial strains, which is really, really fascinating to think about. So they did a dilution of one to 20,000 of usnaic acid, and that slowed and inhibited the growth of gram-positive bacterial infections, like the streptococcus and like the staphylococcus that I was talking about. So pretty amazing to see that stuff happening in actual scientific um, studies. There's also alcohol-based extracts of usnea that have been shown to have anti-tumor and anti-inflammatory actions. The usnaic acid can also be really wonderful for improving resistance to colds and to flus. And then we have the most of those immune stimulating properties are coming from the polysaccharides, which are inside of the white stretchy inner core of the usnea. So I've shared with you instructions on how to be able to extract both the polysaccharide rich and the usnaic acid rich parts of this lichen that are in the recipe. So you do need to heat it and you need to alcohol extract it. We'll talk about that again in a little bit here. So you can use usnea for so many different things. You can use it for things like sinusitis, treating strep throat, bronchitis, pneumonia, pleurisy. If you are somebody that has a lingering lung infection, maybe you've got effects of long COVID, I would certainly consider using usnea in that particular instance. You can blend usnea with other extracts like thyme, just straight out of your kitchen is really powerful medicine. You could use licorice root, your basanta, aurelia, osha, all of these things could be really powerful. I will say osha is something that is at risk and rapidly losing its um, life here on earth, uh, which is unfortunate, I'm definitely unfortunate. 
you can also use usnea as an antibacterial agent specific for urinary tract infection. So if it's somebody dealing with cystitis or urethritis, I highly recommend utilizing some usnea. You could also blend that usnea with uva ursi, which is arctostaphylos or kinikinik. So arctostaphylos, the Latin name is spelled A-R-C-T-O-S-T-A-P-H-Y-L-O-S. You could also consider using yarrow or Achillea millifolium, using corn silk, which I would say definitely go for an organic and non-GMO corn. It's actually the silk in the husk of corn of Z-E-A-M-A-Y-S. Z -E -A -M -A -Y -S. And that combination is really fantastic for urinary tract infections. In fact, if I were working with somebody who had very hot pain and inflamed, painful and inflamed urinary tract infections, I would also consider adding, <clears throat> adding in things like marshmallow root and or slippery elm. I like marshmallow or the Malvaceae mallow family because it's really readily available. Whereas the um, slippery elm, if it's not consciously harvested and grown specific for medicine, it is also something that has been used and abused and over harvested by the greedy humans of the world. So marshmallow will do a fantastic job. You can also use usnea for things like bacterial vaginosis. Uh, I already said streptococcus. You could take anywhere from 30 to 90 drops of these extracts up to five times daily. You can do it solo, just the usnea, or you can do the compounds I had mentioned. You could also use usnea as an antifungal agent, which is really, really wonderful for treating intestinal and vaginal candida. You could combine it with another like super strong antibacterial herb like organ grape or any barbarous species out there. And that's really going to prevent candida overgrowth that may happen due to conventional antibiotics. So having that around to fight would be really, really nice. Again, that's something that you want to take anywhere from 30 to 90 drops, depending on the severity of the condition, depending on the person, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and you could take those drops three times daily for two to four weeks right after using antibiotics. That would be extremely helpful. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, along with that, if you are somebody that's just recovering from the antibiotics, I highly recommend um, using probiotics to support the growth of the beneficial gut bacteria and just inhibit the growth of the bad guys, the candida. Uh, let's see. You could also use that usnea heavily diluted and do like a vaginal irrigation using other herbs like calendula or echinacea. Um, thyme would be really effective during this as well. And then usnea can be a fantastic astringent. So again, that's to tone and tighten um, really loose mucosal tissues and excuse me, and secretions. So other astringents I know and love are yerba mansa or bayberry could be really helpful as well. And then you can use usnea as a topical antifungal. So you could make a hot tea and do a poultice or something along those lines. And you could really use it for athlete's foot, for beard rat, if somebody's got that, for cradle cap, jock itch, ringworm, all of those can be really, really wonderful. And um, well, those aren't wonderful, but the usnea can be wonderful in treating them. And then I want to take a moment and share a story on lung wart. And I really wish the picture was here, but I'm just going to stop share here and share one of my favorite personal stories of using lung wart and how I got to know lung wart. So oftentimes in the world of herbalism and plant medicine and just embracing nature altogether, when you're out there, you learn that these things are communicating amongst one another, right? The plants, the trees, the fungi, all of them are communicating, but they're also communicating with us in a really beautiful, powerful way. 
And so when I started getting into the world of herbalism, I went to my first herbal conference that was at the Brighton Bush Hot Springs in Oregon, it's the Brighton Bush Herbal Conference. And I took a herb walk with one of my herbal elders and her name is Jane Bothwell. And on that walk, she taught me how if you listen, they will teach you. And I left that conference like, oh my gosh, this is what I want to be when I grow up. I want to be an herbalist. I want to share plant medicine with people. I want to save the world with plant medicine. And I was so inspired by these beautiful, brilliant, kind, loving people that I immediately signed myself up for my first in-person herb class, herb school. And fast forward about three months later, I got my first case of bronchitis. And I could not breathe or catch a breath for the life of me. Like I was down and out and I was hacking my lungs like crazy. And I was a good three weeks into this case of bronchitis. And I wasn't going outside because I was so sick. And when I don't go outside, my mental health deteriorates rapidly as well. And so finally, after about three weeks, I said to my partner, like, I've got to go outside. And he took me to one of my favorite trails in the Mount Hood area, an old growth forest trail along the Salmon River. And I started to walk along the trail, but I could literally only take 10, maybe 20 steps if I was lucky before I had to like stop to catch my breath or I would be bent over hacking out my lungs. And then I would go through that session and then I'd be like, okay, I'm done choking like a crazy train hopefully nobody's looking at me in the woods going what is that poor lady doing um and then I would walk another 10 20 steps and then I'd have to stop and I'd have to catch my breath and I would be hunched over and coughing like a crazy train and I did this for about at least five times before I finally recognized that every single time I had stopped and I was hunched over There was a branch in the middle of that trail on that forest floor loaded with lungwort lichen, loaded with it, as if that lungwort was to say, hey, Mel, I'm here for you. I can help you. I am your medicine. Please look at me. Please look at me. I want to help you. And so I finally listened. (laughs) Finally. Gosh, I must be a hard head to get through. And I took home a little bit of that lungwort. Because I had also learned about lung war at that conference several months before. And when I took it home, I made a tea with it, with just a very small piece of the lung war lichen. And after I let it steep for about five to 10 minutes, I took my first sip and I was able to take my first deep breath within 30 seconds that I had had a deeper breath than I had taken in over three weeks since I had the bronchitis. And there I was, this lung wart, just like, hey, me, I'm your friend. I can really help you. And it really does. It's so uh, amazing. And that brings me to like the doctrine of signatures I spoke about earlier. So the doctrine of signatures means like treats like. And if you were to look at the lichen, hopefully you have some in your hands. I I did send some up. I'm not sure if Jennifer was able to get it to you, but it is it looks very much like you would imagine lung tissue, only it's green, right? Hopefully your lung tissue is still pink. Um, <clears throat> if it's not, you might benefit from using lichen, lungwort lichen in your life as well, because it does have an ability to suck out pollutants as well. And then it's also got that pliable kind of rubbery consistency to it that you would dream that maybe your lung tissue might have. So really, really beautiful, really appropriately named lichen that is absolutely incredible for things like bronchitis, for whooping cough, for when you have this like really harsh, raspy, dry cough happening, this can be incredible incredibly potent for you. So another thing to note about lungwort, I know I have mentioned that the best time to gather it is when it is on the forest floor, just waiting for you to grab it. It's also really lovely to allow it to decompose on the forest floor because it is a great contributor 
to the nitrogen reserves for the forest floor. So it's essential for our forest ecosystem. And thankfully it does not take a lot of lungwort for you to get the benefits of the medicine. So I highly recommend getting to know this. It does grow throughout the forest along the whole Pacific Northwest. It is really, really wonderful. And again, as I was mentioning, it is very sensitive to air pollution. It literally will not survive in areas with large amounts of air pollution. <clears throat> and when I think about it, um, it does that. It, it's able to also draw that up. So I think about like those that maybe have been smoking all their lives and are dealing with major lung health issues. This can be an incredible ally. I also learned that some people use lungwort lichen for dyes and that you will be able to observe in the forest various animals actually foraging for it, which is amazing. Um it's also something I would consider using for asthma and you'll see critters that are making nests with it. There is really so much that we can do when it comes to respir respiratory infections and just embracing the forest and the medicine and the housing that it provides for all the creatures in our ecosystem. Um, yeah. So when you think about things that are inflamed vocal cords, so maybe somebody is a singer or a speaker or something along those lines, you could really turn to lung award to support somebody if they're going on stage and you know they're going to talk forever. I, I've been drinking lung award this past week because I did um, have something. I'm not sure exactly what, but the sickness hit my family in a major way and we were all coughing and, you know, runny nose and fevers and all of the things. So, um, lungwort was, and still is our friend. So very, very specific for the rasping cough. Like the, if you sound like a barking seal, you know, you need some lungwort. Uh, when it comes to food use for these lichens, there are people out there that have used them as food. This is not something that I do. So most of the information I'm going to share with you right now comes from other books. Uh, it's definitely not something that you just want to pop in your mouth and eat raw. Ideally, what you're able to do is to leach it or steam it or boil it, um, maybe even boil it with several changes of water, adding baking soda each time to remove various acids that may cause intestinal irritation. Um, after that, you can add them to soups and to stews as a thickener. Some people have used them with fruits to turn them into jellies. Some have used them dried and then powdered as a flour substitute. There's reports of people simmering them as a vegetable and then eating them with wild game or fish turning them into puddings and custards. Again, this is not stuff that I have done, but something you may want to explore with. I also know that um, in Iceland and in Scandinavia, many lichens are actually commercially harvested and then they are turned into a powder that is a base for soups and various desserts. The Kobuk River Eskimos used reindeer lichen as a survival food. They would use it for both people and for dogs, um, which is pretty interesting to think about. You would also see the contents or, or lichen in the slain caribou. You could see that they had been eating it as well. Um, Lots of uses that you could consider. Again, not something that I have done because I would, I have other forest medicines that I'd love to eat that I know are great and don't require quite as much preparation. <clears throat> and again, you can make medicine with this good stuff. So um, with the lungwort, the best way to do that is just through a tea or a decoction. You could blend it with a milk if you want. Ideally, you're drinking four to six ounces up to five times a day of a lungwort lichen tea. I highly encourage you to try some now and kind of taste the very 
gentle, earthy flavor. And if you do have some type of illness that is affecting your respiratory tract, let us know. Are you observing the bronchioles opening and a bit more of air passage and ability to breathe? That would be really nice. Um, you can also make a tincture out of usnea. So again, I did share a recipe with you guys that is all about how to do that. I'll walk you through that in just a moment. Um, you can do a vinegar extract with usnea, but you're only going to get some of the medicinal um, compounds like the polysaccharides would come out in the vinegar but they would not so much in the alcohol. And that's why we have to do like the, the partial warming tea blend and the tincture blend. You technically could use capsules. However, they're not going to be as effective as the alcohol-based preparations that we're talking about. Um, so keeping that in mind, it's just not going to work quite as well. You can also make a tea of the usnea, but ideally you're able to soak it in a little bit of alcohol, like just enough to cover the whole, um, the whole lichen, not like soak it in a bunch of it. Like you just want it all touching alcohol basically. And this is going to help draw out the alcohol soluble constituents like the usnaic acid. And then you will add in the water soluble constituents and um when you're when you're making it into a hot tea and then the alcohol will actually evaporate out of the tea so you don't have to worry about that part as well it can be pretty simple you're just going to add like again a very small amount of alcohol enough to coat the um usnea and you're going to let that sit for 12 hours or so up to 24 hours and then you would do a decoction with water so a simmer of the usnea with some water and you could drink 8 to 12 ounces of that up to four times daily you can also make an antibacterial salve with it where you would need to do what's called the alcohol intermediary method. Very similar as like you just need to coat the usnea for a bit with alcohol and then you're going to add it to a blender and pour it up in the blender um, to make sure that you're getting the alcohol soluble extracts out and into the oil for the things that aren't oil soluble. <clears throat> so those are the ways that you can make quite a bit of medicine with this lichen. And then there are some cautions and contraindications to be aware of. So number one, it's not for pregnancy internally. There's not been much for studies done on this. So to err on the side, side of safety and caution is very, very wise. Some people have experienced dermatitis, so itching or rashiness, redness, things along those lines, inflammation of the skin. If that is you, just simply avoid using it anymore. Um, again, this does a really great job of absorbing pollutants. And then when it has too many pollutants, it does not want to thrive in the forest. It's actually known as the lungs of the forest. And again, if you observe you're in a forest without lots of these lichen, you know, that forest isn't so healthy. So it may not be the place to, um, to gather your medicine in the first place. So really being attentive to potential pollution around where you are is extremely important. So let me just share with you the step-by-step -step and how to in making usnea as a tincture. So give me just a moment and I will pull up my other screen. So this is the um, usnea tincture recipe. So usnea, as I mentioned in the lesson, has usnaic acid, which is a very potent antibacterial agent. And it's really rich in polysaccharides as well. So these polysaccharides are great immune stimulants in various ways. The polysaccharides are not so extractable in alcohol, whereas the usnaic acid is. So this is where we have to kind of dance a couple of different medicine making um, uh, <laughs> strategies together. So ideally what you have is a one to five 
usnia to menstruum ratio. So one part of usnia to five parts of the menstruum. So let's just say in this one, it's five ounces of usnia. And then we are going to do 25 parts of the menstruum. So ideally what we're looking for here is 12 and a half ounces of water and 12 and a half ounces of alcohol that is a 75 to 95% alcohol by volume. <clears throat> so what you can do is just blend up or powder your usnea in like a coffee grinder or something along those lines. And you're going to add that with the water to your crock pot and just stir it well. And then you're going to let that simmer in the crock pot for 48 hours on low heat. You want to let that cool just enough so that you can touch it. And then you want to add in the alcohol. Once you've added in the alcohol, you're going to cover it all, label it, shake it, love it. And you're going to allow that combination to steep for two to six weeks, shaking it on a daily basis. If you come to a point where the simmering in the crock pot eliminates all of the water, just add a little bit more water to the solution and keep adding. And ideally you end up with this 12 and a half ounces of water and 12 and a half ounces of the alcohol. Um, and then at the end of your two to six weeks, uh, you will just strain it and store it in a dark container or a dark area, and you will have a very, very potent bunch of forest medicine that is as simple as usnea, right? So um, you can use this to really help out during cold and flu season. You can use it for fungal infections. You can use it for so many reasons. It's really amazing. <clears throat> I actually used usnea when I was pregnant. I had group B streptococcus and I used garlic and usnea to get rid of that. And it worked absolute wonders for me. Um, and then I really highly encourage you to make yourself some longwort tea and just taste it and feel it. And then whatever you don't use in the tea, go ahead and use later in life when the time is right. It is very easy to store longwort. It will dry up quickly. It will retain its pliability as soon as it hits water. It's a really, really fun lichen to play with and to share with your kids. Um, or grandkids, as is the usnia. And if you guys have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. My email address is mel at theherbalistpath.com. So M-E-L at T-H-E-H-E-R-B-A-L-I-S-T-S com. Again, I'm sorry I wasn't live with you last Friday, and um, I'm really looking forward to our next class in January. We're going to talk all about kitchen medicine because you have so many powerful, incredible herbs right inside of your kitchen cabinet. And we don't always have to go out to the forest to gather everything when we have a whole medicine chest right in the spice rack. So we'll talk about that next month and I cannot wait to share it all with you. Thank you so much for tuning into this lesson and I wish you a very merry holiday and a happy new year. Thanks.